الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله Peace and blessings be upon the Messenger of Allah Muhammad صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين Peace be upon the oppressed progeny أهل البيت صلى الله عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله Peace be upon the master of murders أبي عبد الله الحسين يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة <coughs> O you who was the mercy of Allah and the ship of salvation غريب يا مظلوم كربلا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما We wish we were with, with you so that we may fight for your sake and gain martyrdom. As-salamu ala Sayyidatina wa Mawlatina Khadijata bint Khwayl. Peace be upon the mistress of the women of the world during her time, Khadija. Peace be upon the oppressed Khadija. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Holy Quran, يمحق الله الربا ويرب الصدقات. For love of Lady Khadija alayhi salam, sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. The Islamic laws that were brought down upon the Messenger of Allah Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, were brought down for the benefit of mankind. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not benefit from our worship, nor does he benefit from our obedience. Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us of this reality in the Quran as he says, Ya ayyuhal nas, antumul fuqara'u in Allah, O people, you are the ones in need of Allah, wa huwa al ghaniyul hamid, and he is the unneedy, the praiseworthy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need us to pray for him or to fast or to pay charity. But he brings down the Islamic laws for our own benefit. In other words, when I worship God subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am the one who's attaining the benefit. And when I disobey him, I'm harming my own self. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids something, he forbids it for a reason. Because that thing, that specific deed, is harmful for the human being. Whereas when Allah Ta'ala allows you to do something, that deed, the deed that He allowed you to do, is good for you. It's a deed that benefits you in one way or another. Allah also reminds us of this reality. In Surah Al-A'raf, when He praises the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, and He mentions His attributes saying, يَحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ Saying that the Prophet وسلم, allows the people to do what is good. The lawful deeds are good. Things that are pure 
On the other hand, he forbids them from doing what is impure. He forbids them from doing what harms them. يحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids mankind to do a certain deed, it's because that deed damages the human being, the individual, or society, or both. Amongst the deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade is a deed that is belittled today, unfortunately. And when I say belittled, I don't mean that only disbelievers belittle this deed, but even believers themselves. Even a group of people who will attend the mosque, pray, and fast the month of Ramadan, belittle this particular sin. And that is the sin of riba, usury. It is belittled, unfortunately. You'll see many believers indulging in transactions that involve riba. For this reason, we want to shed light upon this topic today although it is a vast topic, but we want to shed lights upon essential points. The first point, what is riba? How do I know that I am indulging in a transaction that involves riba, that involves usury? Secondly, what does Allah mean when He says, يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ riba وَيُرْبِ sadaqat? Thirdly, what is the danger of riba according to Ahlul Bayt salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim and most importantly how can one avoid performing riba you'll realize that Ahlul Bayt alayhim wa salatu wa salam stress a lot on learning your religion and understanding the religion especially the ahkam the Islamic laws because ultimately one will not be able to dodge forbidden deeds and to obey Allah properly unless he studies the ahkam, the Islamic laws, carefully. And so in order to dodge transactions that involve riba, definitely you need to study the chapter of business, at tijara You have to open the book of your marja, the Islamic laws, for example, Manhaj al-Salihin, and you have to read the different rulings concerning business to make sure you do not fall into usury. Imam Sadiq alayhi afdal salatu was salam, the merciful Imam that was a mercy for mankind, as was his grandfather Rasulullah, peace be upon him and his family, says in a hadith, a narration, Layta siyat ala ru'usi ashabi, hatta yatafakkahu fi deen. I wish that the whips were over the heads of my companions. I wish someone was holding a whip over their heads. Why, O son of Rasulullah? So that they may learn their religion. Imagine, an imam who is as merciful as a sadiq, peace be upon him, he's wishing that someone would stand over our heads with a whip and threaten to whip us so that we may be serious in learning our Islamic laws. Unfortunately, sometimes you'll see a person spending hours and hours on what? On Facebook or Twitter or social networks, reading about things that do not benefit him in this world or the afterlife. But at the end of the day, he does not find a few minutes to open the book of his marja and to learn the Islamic laws. The Imam says, no, I want you to learn it and understand it. Imam Ali, on the other hand, peace be upon him, he is narrated to have said as he was on the pulpit, Ya ma'ashara tujjar, O businessman, al-fiqhu thumma al-matjar. First of all, you need to learn your Islamic laws. You need to understand the religion, the boundaries of your religion, the boundaries that the religion places on you, and then you can indulge in business. Then he repeats his word, Al-fiqhu thumma al-matjar, Al-fiqhu thumma al-matjar. The Imam repeats it three times, alayhi afdal salatu was salam. Then he says, I swear by Allah, لَالْرِبَا فِي هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ أَخْفَى مِنْ دَبِيبِ النَّمْلِ عَلَى الصَّفَى. 
He swears by Allah that usury amongst the Islamic nation is more hidden than the slow walk of an ant on a stone. Imagine, if, a, if an ant is walking on a soft stone, can you hear its walk? You can't hear its steps. The Imam says, riba, usury, is hidden. The Islamic laws, especially concerning business, are very precise. And so one must understand them carefully. As Sayyid Muhsin al as Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id al Hakim, may Allah prolong his life, one of our current maraja. He says it is sad to see that sometimes a believer will indulge in a transaction and then he'll ask whether this transaction is valid or not, whether it's lawful or not, only to find out that he has fallen into a big problem that is difficult to solve. He says, I wish he would have asked before he indulged in the transaction. Indeed, we need to spend some time acquiring, learning the Islamic laws. What is it about? What is usury? The maraja in general divide usury into two. Riba fil muhamala, which means usury in a transaction, such as buying and selling. And riba fil qard, usury in loaning, in a loan. I'll give you an example of both so that you may have a good understanding, but keep in mind that you must review the ahkam concerning this topic because there are numerous rulings. When we come to usury in transactions, you know, imagine you have two people, Zaid and Amr. They want to, Zaid wants to buy something from Amr. They agree to buy and sell the same product. A product that is sold based on its weight or based on its volume. When you go to Freshco, for example, or Food Basics, what do you see? You see, for example, that one pound of apples costs a dollar or two, right? One pound of oranges costs a dollar or two, so on and so forth. So here we have selling based on kale, meaning based on volume. Sometimes, sorry, based on weight. And sometimes the selling is based on the volume. For example, one liter of milk costs a dollar, as an example. So Zayd and Amr agree to sell each other tomatoes. Amr says, I will sell you 10 tomatoes that are in a perfect condition. Zayd tells him, I accept, and I'll sell you 20 tomatoes that aren't as good. This is an example of riba. Riba fil muamala, usually in transaction. It's invalid, it is haram, it is forbidden to do so. Another example, Zayd wants to sell Amr 50 kilos of medjool dates. And Amr wants to give him, in return, a hundred kilos of dates from Medina. Because they're selling the same product, dates, and they are, there's a difference in the amount given to each other, and dates is a product that's sold based on its weight or its volume. Thus, this is an example of usury in a transaction. As for usury in loan, imagine you have Zayd and Amr again, and Zayd wants to pay his tuition. He's in need of money. He tells Amr, Amr, lend me $10,000. Amr tells him, sure, I'll lend you 10000 However, you must pay back, you must pay me back 12000 not 10000 if he had told him 10,000, it would be fine. But because he asked for something extra, he asked for an amount beyond what he is going to lend Amr or Zayd. In this case, this is considered to be riba, usury. In other words, when you charge a person interest, that's a form of usury. What's dangerous about usury is that it's not only forbidden to charge a person interest, but it's also forbidden to pay the interest. It's also forbidden to pay it. So in this, in this case, you might ask yourself, how are we supposed to live today 
when riba usually has filled the earth, everywhere you go, there is usury. How are you supposed to live? You must learn your ahkam to be able to know how to dodge, how to avoid the usury. Allah tells you, يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ الرِّبَى وَيُرْبِ الصَّدَقَاتِ Usury will be wiped out gradually. Why does a person involve himself in transactions that involve usury? To gain money, right? Why does the bank charge you interest, for example? To gain money. Allah tells them, no, you're wrong. If you think that riba will grant you more money, you are wrong. Riba, number one, will wipe out your faith. Number two, the money you acquire from riba, sooner or later, will evaporate. However, yurbi sadaqat, when you pay sadaqah, when you give charity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it appears that you're losing money. But in reality, you're saving the money. Saving it where? Saving it in a bank that does not lose its money. Which bank? Not Scotia Bank, or TD, or Royal Bank. The bank of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you pay sadaqah, the sadaqah is going where? In the bank of God, Azza wa Jal. Imam al-Sajjad, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, when he would pay charity, the imam would kiss his hand. So once he was asked, why do you kiss your hand, O son of Rasulullah? Why do you kiss your hand when you pay sadaqah? The imam said, because when I pay charity, the charity falls in the hands of God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. God does not have physical hands, but what is meant here, the power of God, Azza wa Jal. The charity falls in the hands of God before it falls in the hands of the beggar. Meaning Allah, Azza wa Jal, instantaneously accepts it. Imam al-Sadi tells us, alayhi salatu salam, that Allah, Azza wa Jal, says, when a person pays charity, instantaneously I accept, I grab hold of his charity. I've authorized some of my creations to grab hold of everything except for charity. I grab hold of it. For example, who extracts our souls upon death? Malik al-Mawd alayhi salam. With the permission of God without doubt. But there's an angel that Allah has authorized to take our souls. Who writes our deeds? Al-Kiram al katibin our angels on our right and left sides, alayhim as -salam. But when it comes to sadaqah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am the one who grabs hold of it. So when you're paying charity in reality, you're not losing the money. In reality, you're saving it. In fact, the money is going to grow because Allah said, yurbi sadaqat. Allah azza wa jal, makes it grow and grow and grow. When you come on the Day of Judgment, you see that this one sadaqah you paid, that was maybe a piece of bread or a piece of date, this sadaqah has turned so big, it is bigger than the Mount of Uhud. Allah Azza wa Jal makes it grow. يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ الرِّبَى وَيُرْبِ Allah does not bless usury. And he causes charitable deeds to prosper. And so there is no blessing in usury. Allah Azza wa is trying to open our eyes, telling us, oh people, do not think that, this, that usury is good for you. Usury is destructive. It destroys the society. It causes enmity. It causes grudges. Because it separates the community. All of a sudden, you have a group of people who are rich, who are exploiting plenty of other people who are needy. Whereas, when you pay sadaqah, when you tell the beggar, or the poor individual, or the needy, you know what? Here's a piece of charity, keep it for yourself. I don't want you to pay me back the money I gave you. This deed, causes amity, friendship, 
spreads love amongst the community. And when you have amity, friendship, and the likes, people start to progress. The Imams والسلام, warned us from usury. Believe it or not, unfortunately, some of us view the sin to be at the bottom of the chain when it comes to sins. As if it is insignificant, as if it is a minor deed that we should not be concerned of. When in reality, there is no minor deed. There is no minor sin. In other words, all sins are grave because when you sin, you're disobeying who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, when you compare one sin to the other, then you have a minor and a major sin. For example, swearing at a mu'min is a major sin in itself. But when you compare it to cutting a mu'min's limb, then it becomes a minor sin. Cutting a believer's limb is a major sin, but when you compare it to killing the believer, it's a minor sin. Killing the believer is much more grave. You know what the Imams say, السلام, They tell you that usury is worse than adultery. In fact, it's worse than incest. Could you imagine? Allahu Akbar. Yet you see plenty of mu'mineen, unfortunately, indulging in transactions concerning that that involve usury. How grave is adultery? We know that adultery is one of the major sins. One of the worst things that a person could do, God forbid. Let us see a hadith, a narration, that mentions the effects of adultery so we understand how grave it is and then we'll have a better understanding of how grave usury is. Imam Ali alayhi afdal salatu wassalam says the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa said, adultery has six effects, six after effects. Three take place in this world and three take place in the afterlife. The first one, yudhibu binur al wajh. Sometimes you see a believer, a pious believer, you feel as if his or her face is shining with light. That is one of the effects of being a good individual. Being a person who prays Salat al-Fajr and Salat al-Layl and reads Quran. Allah gives you some sort of light in your face. That light is snatched away, removed when a person commits adultery. It cuts his sustenance. Do you want health? Do you want knowledge? Do you want wealth? piety, a good spouse, good children, that's all part of rizq, then avoid adultery. And it draws a person's death close to him. In fact, it makes that event, it brings the death closer to the individual. It makes him die quickly. Those are three effects in this world. What about the afterlife, Ya Rasulullah? He says, as for the afterlife, فَغَضَبُ rab. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be angry with him, which means punishment is prepared for that individual. Secondly, سُوءُ hisab. Allah will question him, and he will make his questioning very difficult. Can you imagine how difficult the reckoning will be? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us about every minute in our lives. I'm not going to say every second. Imagine if Allah ta'ala asked me and you about every minute. What did you do in that minute? Why did you do it? Why didn't you avoid the sin? What would happen? How long would your questioning be? You'd be standing for years and years in the mahshar on the day of judgment. Adultery causes su al hisab. Last but not least, what dukhul aw al khulud fil nar. The narration has two forms. One of them says he will enter hellfire, the other says he will remain in hellfire for eternity. Of course, this is if the person doesn't repent. 
if a person fell into this sin, God forbid, he can repent. There's always a chance to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to erase his sin through repentance. These are the effects of adultery. Imam al-Sadiq tells you usury is worse than adultery. Worse than incest. Yet you see that usury fills the world today. Possibly we have reached an era mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in a narration as he says, يَأْتِ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٍ لَا يَبْقَى أَحَدٌ إِلَّا أَكَلَ الرِّبَى There will be an era in which everyone will consume money that was acquired through usury. Everyone, Ya Rasulullah, no one will avoid this sin. He says, no. There is a group who will avoid it. But yet, they will be affected by it. So he says, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَأْكُلْهُ أَصَابَهُ مِنْ غُبَارِهِ Literally meaning, if I want the literal translation, tra translation, he's saying that the person who doesn't consume the money acquired through usury, that individual will be touched by its dust. Meaning, he will be affected in one way or another. Today, it is difficult to avoid usury, but it's not impossible. Alhamdulillah, our maraja have discussed this issue in their books, and they have given us solutions to dodge the usury, and so we need to learn these ahkam, these rulings, to make sure we do not fall into a sin. We need to follow the example of the great Khadija, alayha afdal as-salat was salam, Khadija bint Khuwaylid. Khadija was a proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in what sense? You know Allah Azza wa Jal sometimes He uses one human against the other. Let me clarify what I mean. If a person claims, if a person objects to Allah Azza wa Jal on the Day of Judgment, telling him, Ilahi, you placed me in an era in which it was impossible for me to believe in you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might bring a person who lived in the same era, but believed in God azza wa jal, to use him as a proof against him, telling him that this individual went through the same circumstances you went through, yet he still believed. So if you were right, why did he believe and you did not? Khadija alayhi salam is a proof that Allah can use against everyone who performs business and performs sins with the excuse, I need to sin to make more money. Khadija alayhi salam did not sin. Khadija alayhi salam did not use cheating or usury or any haram means to gain wealth. She worked with halal. She worked with lawful means. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her with a fortune. Khadija was a proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon everyone who did not pay khums or everyone who does not want to pay khums. When you look at khums, what do you see? You see a just law. Allah tells you, I want 20%. In fact, I own 20% of your money, but not your whole wealth, 20% of your savings. If you have no savings, then there's no khums upon you. You don't have to pay the khums. Some people find it difficult to pay 20% of their savings. Khadija did not find it difficult to pay everything. Not 20 or 60%, she paid 100%. All for God subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yesterday you heard, for those of you who were here, when Abu Talib alayhi salam and the Muslims, Banu Hashim specifically, were besieged when they were boycotted in Shihab Abi Talib. How did they survive for three years? Who was feeding the Muslims? Who was feeding Banu Hashim? How did they live? Khadija alayha salatu salam. Khadija spent all of her wealth in support of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam until nothing was left. Nothing. Khadija did not even have a shroud for herself. Can you imagine? Not even a shroud to cover her own co corpse 
after she passes away. Khadija alayhi salam pleased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very much. And thus, Jibreel alayhi salam one day descended upon the Prophet, telling him, Ya Rasulullah, here is Khadija. She is coming forth holding a pot. What is in that pot? The narration says food or water. He tells him, Ya Rasulullah, convey Khadija, the salam of God and my salam. And tell her that there is a house in heaven prepared for her. A house made from canes. A house in which she will find rest and peace. Khadija bint Khuwaylid salawatullahi wa salamu alayha. Yes, pleased Allah. The Prophet conveyed Khadija the salam of God. She said, who was salam? One of the names of God is the peace, meaning the one who is completely free from all deficiencies, deficiencies, from all incompleteness, imperfections. And peace is from him and peace returns to him. Now, Khadija sallallahu wa sallam gave everything for the path in the sake of God Azza wa Jal. When she was on the brink of dying, she had a touching dialogue with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She told him three things, three different wells. The first one she said, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to forgive me for any shortcomings any faults, anything I've done, I want you to forgive me for not fulfilling your right fully. The Prophet told her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ya Khadija, you did not show me any shortcomings, any faults. You strived, you, you, you strived and you tried your best. You spent all of your money in the sake of in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She told him, Ya Rasulullah, I fear the grave. I fear from the punishment of the grave. Imagine Khadija alayhi salam, who was the mistress of the women of the world. During her time, she fears of what will happen to her when she is placed in her grave. What about the likes of me? Shouldn't we fear what will happen to us in our graves? Will we be punished? Will we go through the squeeze, daghtat al-qabr? Or will our grave turn into a small paradise, a small garden from the gardens of paradise? Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam looks at the future in dua Abi Hamza thuwali and reminds us of our future he reminds us that one day, yes, we will be carried to our graves. One day we will sleep in that dark grave. So what will happen? We ask Allah Ta'ala to have mercy upon us. So Khadija tells him, alayhi salam, Ya Rasulullah, I fear from the punishment of the grave. I want you to shroud me, wrap my body with the cloak you wear when revelation descends upon you. The Prophet ﷺ promised her that he will do so. He brought the cloak to her. He presented the cloak to Khadija. And so she rejoiced. The narration says when she passed away, والسلام, and the Prophet washed her body, placed the hanut on it. When he was about to place his cloak on her, who descended? Jibra'il alayhi salam. He tells him, Ya Rasulullah, Allah Ta'ala conveys you his salam. And he tells you, Khadija spent all of her wealth for our sake. And so it is upon us to provide her with a shroud, with a kafan. Jibra'il presents a shroud from heaven. And so Khadija is shrouded by two, by Allah himself and by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Wasallam. Now last but not least, the last will is the heartbreaker. She tells him, 
pointing to Fatima to Zahra, peace be upon her, the little Fatima, who was still a little girl at that time. I tell you, Ya Rasulullah, take care of Fatima after me. She tells him, she will be a lonely orphan after me. Do not let anyone from the women of Quraysh hurt her. Do not let anyone slap her cheek and do not let anyone for, do not let anyone from the women of Quraysh slap her cheek. Do not let anyone scream or shout in her face. And do not let anyone disturb her. Yes, indeed, these words are heartbreaking. Why? Because they remind us of a day in which Fatima experienced all of these. Ya Khadija, peace be upon you. I wish you were present to see what happened to your beloved daughter days after Rasulullah passed away. Way, way. Peace, Peace be upon him and his family. family. I wish you I were, wish present, were to present to see how her enemies, her enemies surrounded, surrounded her house. house. And the house of her husband, Ali, peace be upon him. And that man threatened to burn the house. Naam ya Khadija, he threatened to burn your own daughter. Calling out, لَتَخْرُجَنَّ إِلَى الْبَيْعَى Listen to this narration, O oh believer. Khadija sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressed a lady called Asma, telling her, These two earrings are for my daughter Fatima. Give her these earrings on the day of her wedding. Naam when Fatima married Imam Ali, Asma came to her. She told her, O oh Fatima, this is a gift from your mother Khadija alayhi salam. Ma'am Fatima accepted the gift. Now let us go to the day when the house of Ali was raided. The man who attacked the house, who barged in, he says when I came in, Fatima alayhi salam stood in my face. Shining with the bright light, the light aligned with my eyes. So, what did you do? He says, and so I slept on her cheek. I laughed at the mother. I slapped her over the so hard that her two. I 
So she went out to the graveyard of Baqiyah. Every day she would leave to Baqiyah and cry for the prophet beside the grave of the people in Baqiyah. As if Fatima alayhi salam addressed her only all Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam with these lines of poetry. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله تعنت الله سبحانه وتعالى اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك بأحب الخلق إليك محمد وعليا وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين فرج عنا يا الله We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of Sahib al-Zaman to make us from his sincere followers and supporters. We ask Allah azza wa jal to forgive us for our sins, to accept our deeds, 
to amplify our rewards and to keep us with Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, peace be upon them all. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect our dear Imam Sahib al-Zaman, to protect all believers, to protect the shrines of Ahlul Bayt salam and to heal the sick believers around the globe for the sake of our sick Imam Zain al-Abideen, peace be upon him. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to fulfill our needs. If anyone has a need, ask it at the moment and God will answer your call. Allahumma bihaqqi sayyidatina wa mawlatina khadija salawatullahi alayha iqdi hajata kulli muhtaj اقضي حاجة كل محتاج لا سيما حوائج من سألنا الدعاء we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the souls of the dear believers who have passed away, especially our family members, and especially those who are completely forgotten and never mentioned. We will recite Surah Al-Fatiha and send its rewards in the words of our majlis to their graves after a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.